Okay, so let's turn to page 58 and talk about the presuppositions of NLP. Now we've given you a mnemonic device there, respect your world. <laughs> and each letter there represents one of the presuppositions of NLP. So we've got 14, 14 presuppositions of NLP. And these presuppositions are simply convenient assumptions. You see, we think that all problems are made up of limiting decisions, limiting beliefs, strategies, parts, negative emotions, etc. And what these presuppositions allow us to do is the way in how we think about our client will make a difference in how we deal with our client. So these presuppositions are not necessarily true. They're just convenient assumptions, almost like beliefs that we want to have about our client because it will change how we work with our client. In fact, let me give you an example. Imagine that there are two people. One person that is a great friend and that you really like and another person that you really, really dislike. Can you think of a situation where they might say the exact same thing maybe make a joke and the person who's your friend well you know you'll take it as a joke but the person that you really dislike you'll take it as sarcasm and wit and just not like the comment at all that's quite natural to happen and so what we're saying is if we can have these assumptions about our client it will change how we work with them so that we can see them in the best light and so that we can really help them achieve what it is that they need to achieve. So the first presupposition we have is respect for the other person's model of the world. So each person has a different viewpoint and they'll notice things that maybe you've missed and vice versa. And they, their view of reality of course is just as valid as our view of reality they have a certain model of the world a certain perception of what the world is like and we want to respect that we want to work with the client in their model of the world we don't want to buy into it but we want to respect it we don't want to feel sorry for them but we want to have empathy now of course it doesn't mean that we have to agree with their model of the world because we all have our own beliefs and our own values etc but we want to work within their model of the world you see the problem comes when people want to judge and push against somebody else's model of the world and what this hell does is it actually helps us to understand how they do the problem in fact Stephen Covey said seek first to understand then to be understood and I think it's important if we respect somebody else's model of the world where they're coming from then we're much more likely to be able to assist them and you know we can appreciate where they're coming from so Tad James gave, gave a great example of this he spoke about a client and a practitioner and the client said you know what I have people that come out the TV and follow me around now, of course, if you say to the person, well, you must be crazy, mate, because nobody comes out the TV and follows you around, that's not going to build rapport. And so the practitioner asked the client and said, okay, so who's following you around? And the client said, oh, it's Mary from Little House on the Prairie. And the practitioner was working within the client's model of the world and said, well, you know what? Does the term Playboy channel mean anything to you? Because if you're going to have somebody follow you around, wouldn't it be better to be a penthouse pet of the year? Now, that's an example of working within the client's model of the world. So we want to respect their model of the world. The second one, behavior and change are to be evaluated in terms of context and ecology. Now, we've spoken about ecology a couple of times. Essentially, what will be the impact on the client, family, society and the planet you know the overall system because we are part of a larger whole we form part of the larger whole of the universe and all the systems interact and impact on each other 
So we don't ever want to have any negative impact on anything else. Number three, resistance in a client is a sign of lack of rapport. So there's no resistant clients, only inflexible communicators. And effective communicators accept and utilize all communication presented to them. So we want to build more rapport. And we're going to work with what the client gives us. We, as the client speaks to us and gives us information, we want to build rapport with the client. We want to respect their model of the world. And we want to utilize everything that they're giving to us. P, people are not their behavior. Accept the person, but change the behavior. We said that when we looked at doing a feedback sandwich. We want to separate the person from the behavior. If somebody messes up, we don't say, you're a screw up. Just because they made a mess up doesn't mean that the person is a screw up. It just means that that behavior might not have been the best. So behavior is changeable. We want to separate the person from the behavior so we can work with the behavior and the person then doesn't have to take it personally. It's like somebody saying to a child, oh, you stupid, can't you do that? And of course, then the child personalizes that and really believes that they're stupid. Everyone is doing the best that they can with the resources they have available. Behavior is geared for adaption and the present behavior is the best choice available. And every behavior is motivated by positive intent. So everyone is doing the best that they can with the resources they have available. That, of course, also means forgiveness. You know, I, I can remember with my oldest daughter, when she was younger, there's many things I did and said. And, you know, I did it with the resources that I had available. And it's only the more I study and the more I learn that I'm able to become better, whatever better might be. So this is a, a wonderful presupposition for actually for forgiveness. So that includes you forgiving yourself and forgiving other people. You know, have you ever done something and then you thought afterwards, I wish I didn't do that? Or why did I do that? You see, all behavior has a positive intention, although it's positive for you, it might not be positive for the other person. So everything, even if somebody robs somebody, it has a positive intention for the robber. Of course, it's not a positive intention for the person that's being robbed. Right, C, we want to calibrate on behavior. And the most important information about the person is that person's behavior, not lip service. People say one thing and they do something else. We want to calibrate on what are they doing? What actions are they taking or not taking? Then T, the map is not the territory. So the words we use are not the event or the item that they represent. And so Alfred Korzybski again said, the label we give is not the experience itself. The map is not the territory. You see, all maps leave out information. The question is not really, is the map true? The question is, is the map useful? You see, a map is useful to the extent that it helps you find your way to where you want to go. The map doesn't describe the whole terrain. The menu is not the whole meal. I do this in, in the training and I say, okay, everybody in the class, one by one, think of the word picnic and say the first thing that comes to your mind as you think about picnic. And we all have our own internal representation. So what I think of the word picnic might be totally different to the next person, to the next person, to the next person. And that's simply just one word. Remember that we actually cannot describe our experience with the words that we use. We're only trying to describe it, but we can't describe it in such a way where it's a true representation of what we are experiencing. So what I think of what communication is might be totally different to my client's definition of communication. So the map is not the territory. Next, we've got U for 
you in charge of your mind and therefore your results. I'm in charge of my mind and therefore my results. So this is really about taking responsibility for your life. This is cause and effect. Sometimes you have things in your mind that are not positive and you can still choose what you want to focus on. Focus on what you want and not what you don't want. As Richard Bandler said, he said, who's driving your bus? You know, who's the driver of your mind? And of course, we each are our own drivers. And so taking responsibility for your life. Next, we've got people have all the resources they need to succeed and to achieve the, the desired outcomes. There's no unresourceful people, only unresourceful states. Now, Erickson said, we already have all the resources that we need. We just need to get in touch with those resources. You see, remember, you can't contemplate what's not already inside of you. And people have many limiting beliefs about what's possible for them. So you can achieve so much more if you just tap into that true potential. If somebody else can do it, then you can learn to do it too. So people have the resources that they need. That's not to say that you have all the information that you need. You don't know how to fly until you've gone and done some flying lessons. But you have the resources available inside you to be able to go and do the flying lessons and then get the learnings that you need to to become a pilot. W. All procedures should increase wholeness. This works on the principle that people are already so fragmented. And that's actually one of the reasons why we do parts integration in our school of NLP. See, more parts at the unconscious level, the more chance there is for conflict. And wholeness is best. So we want to integrate the parts. Next, we've got this only feedback. So no failure, only feedback. Now, we've spoken about this a couple of times. You see, many people fear failure. Failure brings fear, anxiety, depression, etc. Actually, if we just see it as feedback, learning in itself is simply a process of eliminating all the outcomes that don't work. Babies don't see failure. They fall over and over and over and over again until they stand up. Edison said he found 10,000 ways not to create the filament. So probably you want to fail more regularly. The, to be more successful, you've got to fail more. The only time you experience failure is when you give up. So next we've got R. The meaning of your communication is the response that you get. Have you ever told somebody to do something and they did something different? Or you told them something and they totally took it up the wrong way? Think about a text or email. How easy is it to misunderstand them? And people take up, or maybe you've done it yourself. Somebody sent you a text message or email or said something and you took it up the wrong way. You see, you might even get an extreme reaction. Actually, your body language might be saying something else. So you might be saying something verbally, but body language saying something totally different. The thing is, we are all totally responsible, 100% responsible for our communication. And the interesting thing is that you cannot not communicate. Even if you just sat quietly, you're still communicating and people are forming an opinion about you. So if I'm saying something and the person takes it up the wrong way or they do a different thing to what I asked, then of course I need to ask myself, how else do I need to say this or how else do I need to communicate this so that they can get the right message? I think all too often people give over the responsibility for their communication and they just say, oh, well, you misunderstood me rather than taking responsibility for their own communication. Next, we've got L for the law of requisite variety. So the system or the person with the most flexibility of behavior will control the system. There's many ways to skin a cat. If one way doesn't work, 
do it another. This is about behavioral flexibility. So we get feedback. Did it work? No? Okay, let's do it a different way. And, you know, sometimes people think, yeah, if we say the, syst the person or the system with the most flexibility will control the system, and they think of control as a bad word. And in this case, think of control as influence or be able to adapt rather than a negative think of control. And then finally, we got D for all procedures should be designed to increase choice. So we don't want to limit our clients. We want to give them more choices. If you've got more choices, you've got greater freedom. You see, very often client comes to you and they think that they only have one choice. Or they think they don't have any choices. Or they think they've got to make a choice between two things. And so we want to help our client recognize that they've got multiple choices and different ways of being able to do something. So these are the presuppositions of NLP. And, you know, just think about this. What impact do you think your thoughts and belief about your clients can have on the way that you work with them? Consider how you act towards somebody that you like versus somebody that you dislike. And we'll talk about the presuppositions of NLP again as we go through the training.